All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this session. And today I'll be talking about the rise of vector databases. What are they? Why should you care? And in particular, how do they relate to the sudden surge of interest that we've seen in large language models or LLMs? And before we dive in, a quick introduction to both myself as well as the company. Uh, my name is Frank. A pleasure to be here giving this talk to every, everybody today. I do a lot of machine learning at Zillas, and there are my socials as well as email down there. If you want to get in touch with me, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, I'm happy to talk about them. I'm happy, I'm happy to take them. So a bit about us first, a bit about Zillas. Uh, so we are the company behind Milvis. Milvis is actually a Linux foundation, specifically an LFAI data foundation project. Um, you know, Milvis is the world's most popular open source vector database, freely available on GitHub, coming close to 20,000 stars at this point. So we've seen a lot of great growth in the community as well. And for folks who aren't quite aware what a vector database is, uh, you know, bear with me. I'll get to that um, sort of a little bit later on in the first section as well. We are headquartered in sunny San Francisco or the San Francisco Bay Area. So one of the perks of being in Silicon Valley and the product that we provide, the managed service that we provide is called Zillas Cloud and it is based on Milvis. Right? It gives you flexible, powerful storage, search, indexing, querying for any type of embedding, any dimension, uh, and you get lightning fast queries, uh, absolutely zero ops overhead and very, very cost efficient storage as well. Very important for any kind of database. So sort of a quick intro into some of the things that I'll be talking about in this presentation. First, I'll go over what unstructured data and embeddings are. I'll then jump into what a vector database is, and it'll tie in, tie in very closely with a lot of the knowledge that we, you know, that we gain in the first section. And then I have a very special section on vector databases plus LLMs as well. We've seen a huge sudden surge of interest in things like ChatGPT, Bard, Claude, so on and so forth. Uh, and I really wanted to dedicate a section to show you how these fit into, how these really fit together into a single stack. Then we'll go over some key takeaways uh, before we sort of end the session there. So without further ado, let's dive right in, right? Unstructured data and embedding. So I always like to start off these kinds of presentations with uh, a question, right? What is unstructured data? And really unstructured data is any data that does not conform to a predefined data model. What does that mean, right? Uh, if we look at the history or the evolution of data, you know, way back to the 1960s when the ENAC came out, uh, really a big, you know, a key factor, a key motivation for having all, you know, for having computers was storage, search and indexing of data. But, uh, you know, a lot of data that started out in the early days was structured data that could be fit into, you know, let's say an RDBMS as a table, or it could be, you know, let's say, you know, by the mid 2000s, we had a lot of document databases coming out, such as MongoDB, a wide column store such as Cassandra. And now we are very squarely in the middle of the IoT, you know, the mobile device era. And so much of the data that we generate today, whether it be graphs, uh, you know, images, video, geospatial data, audio, you know, all of this is great examples of unstructured data, data that you can't really fit into a traditional table, table-based database. Uh, relational database or an object database, right? And you need some special purpose-built data or database to be able to store this type of unstructured data. But it's very hard, right? If data is unstructured, how do you give it structure? How do you make it uh, something that is indexable? That's something. How, how do you make it something that a computer can understand? And the way to do that is with vectors, hence the name vector database. Now, one of the key paradigms that we see here is taking a knowledge base that we have, whether it be images, video, audio, text, natural language, uh, in this case, something like documents, and using deep learning models, we turn them, we perform inference on them, we turn them into these high dimensional embeddings or these high dimensional vectors or tensors, right? And then we store them in a vector database such as Milvis uh, or Zilla's Cloud, right? Um, and this is just to visualize exactly how these embeddings work. Now, if we go back to the previous slide, you know, we say, okay, these embeddings are generated from deep learning models. Uh, I won't go too much into the details here, but in this picture here, what you see is taking images, in particular, taking images of digits from the MNIST data set and looking at nearest embeddings. So if I have, let's say, a 120 dimensional embedding, on embedding of size 128, uh, all of my images can be turned into these types of, 
can be turned into these fixed length embeddings and I can see, okay, given a query digit or a query image of a digit in this case, what are my nearest neighbors? Uh, and you know, credit to Eric Byrne. I think um, you know, it was a, uh, you know, th these were sort of a part of his slides a while back. But these digits here, what you see, are the nearest neighbors to the digits that you see on the left, right? And I think there's a lot of semantic information behind all this. If we look at the bottom left-hand corner. Is that a six or is that a zero? Well, I think if you look at the nearest neighbors, it gives you, you know, the, the, the neural network, or in this case, uh, the set of embeddings that we have is a bit indicative of, hey, it could go either way, right? That's really the power of embeddings generated by these trained neural networks, by these trained machine learning models. Now we can do the same thing for food. If you train a classifier, if you train, let's say, you know, either in a self-supervised uh, or a supervised way, you know, images over food, uh, you can see, hey, you know, these are very related as well. At the top, I have fries. Um, then I have uh, that looks like something along the lines of Korean barbecue on the second row, uh, and a variety of other different types of dishes on the third, fourth, and fifth rows as well. But they're all semantically related to my query image, to my input image on the left. Now, beyond just images, we can also do, we can also look at natural language as well. We can also look at words. So this is a very, very old model. This is word uh, and this is the TensorFlow projector. But if you look, you know, words that are a little bit more scientific or towards the top, words related to you know, a lot of functions, processes, more mathematics are over in the right. And then you have a lot of names on the bottom, right? And this goes to show you that, hey, these embeddings really do encode some level of information. Unstructured data, which is more similar to each other, have closer embeddings. And that is really the key principle that vector databases leverage to be able to do large scale search, indexing, and storage of this unstructured data. So, you know, a bit about, you know, I want to, now that we sort of have a better understanding of what embeddings are, I want to talk a little bit about nearest neighbor search as well. Now, as we saw from in the previous three slides, right, nearest neighbor search is really about finding similar data. As embeddings are closer to, to each other, we get more similar data and vice versa as well. That means that if I have further embeddings, embeddings which are further away from each other by some distance metric that I use, it means my data is less similar, right? Closer embeddings equals similar data, whereas further embeddings equals more dissimilar data. But this property is great, and it allows me to do a lot of amazing things with embeddings, such as recommend it, you know, such as build recommender systems, uh, you know, do de 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 deduplication, so on and so forth. But brute force search is really incredibly slow for, let's say, anything above one million vectors. If I have um, you know, if I have 1 million vectors and I try to do brute force search over it, it's going to take me a long, long time, right? And you can imagine if I have, let's say, internet scale data sets, a, a billion vectors or maybe 10 billion vectors or even more, it's pretty much untenable. There's no way that you can build a real-time system by doing nearest neighbor search over 1 million vectors. And that's really what brings us to approximate nearest neighbor search. The idea being that if I can build an index of vectors, right? This will penalize, you know, I'll get a small penalty in recall. Basically, I won't have my exact nearest neighbors, but if I can get pretty close, let's say 95, 99%, I am okay with that penalty as long as it significantly speeds up my search process. All right, so instead of doing brute force search, um, you know, let's say instead of doing brute force search, something like uh, order n over the entire data set, maybe if I can get it to log n, right? That's something that would be very, very good for my particular real-time application. And there are a variety of different index type po types possible. I can go for hash-based indexes, quantization-based indexes. I can look at graph-based indexes, tree-based indexes. You know, there are a lot of various different types of indexes, and these indexes are really what allow me to do very, very scalable approximate nearest neighbor search, allow me to do it very, very quickly as well. Right now, again, as I mentioned, I won't go too much into the detail of each index, but happy to sync up with any folks offline. Uh, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, uh, you know, connect with me on any of my socials as well. I'd be happy to chat about that. So what is a vector database, right? And a vector database is any database that is purpose-built, keyword purpose-built, to store, index, and search, search or query, large quantities of embeddings. And Zillis and Milvis, uh, Milvis in particular, is a great example of a vector database, 
right? And why did we create a purpose-built database, right? What are the lessons from this particular undertaking? And really, you know, you have these vector search libraries such as Face, uh, HNSW Lib, um, you know, Scan. These are great libraries. They give you high-performance vector search. But if you want to be able to do go beyond that, if you want a lot of traditional database features, if you want, you know, replication, if you want failover, if you want, you know, automatic indexing, auto index, this really, you, you have to have a vector database, a vector database such as Milvis, right? It goes beyond a pure library such as face. And that is really why purpose build is necessary, but purpose build is complex at the same time, right? And, you know, if I have, you know, oftentimes, you know, I'm an application developer and I want to, let's say, maybe have an application that has high query load. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, a couple, couple months or a couple years down the road, I find, hey, maybe I don't need that much query load, but I want to be able to do high insertion and deletion. I want, you know, really, really high uh, edit capabilities for my database. Maybe I want full precision recall. Maybe I do want to use brute force search rather than an approximate, approximate nearest neighbor search if I have a small data set. And maybe I want accelerator support as well, right? And there's many, many more different types of applications and different types uh, of query paradigms and you know uh, different ways that people will use your database or your vector search library. And that is why purpose built is very hard. Now, you know, I think in in, in, in prior times or in prior years, I would actually go into each of the different layers of Milvis. This is the Milvis architecture. Again, Milvis being the world's most popular open source vector database, part of the LFAI Data Foundation. But uh, I won't go too much into that today, but just know that there are these different layers inside of Milvis. Uh, I'm happy to point you to some previous uh, sort of presentations or work or, or articles that, that we've done, which, which talk a little bit more about this. But there are different layers inside of Milvis, and there are very, very specific types of nodes that are there for very certain for certain things. All of this can run on Kubernetes, so it is a distributed database. I know that sort of scares some folks here, saying hearing the word distributed database. But we have standalone versions as well. We have we also have embedded versions, versions that you can just simply pip install if you're using Python, uh, or simply as, uh, as simple as really grabbing a library, downloading that, and going from there, right? So all these different layers are very, very important in that they give you the capability to have different types of applications. So if I have, let's say, a query, if I want to run a lot of data over query, if I want to do a lot of querying, I simply expand the query cluster. If I want to, you know, do a lot of insertions, I'll expand the data, the data cluster. And if I have, if I need to maintain a very up-to-date index at all times, you know, I can expand the number of index nodes, the index cluster that I have as well. Right. So, uh, again, I won't go too much into this, but, um, you know, happy to point you to some other presentations which dive a little bit deeper into the Movis architecture. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about vector databases plus LLMs. Right. Um, and, you know, we've seen a huge. Oh, what's the right word to use? Surge or, you know, something something beyond, you know, pick any word beyond surge. Uh, surge in interest in you know chat gpt and a lot of other auto regressive language models right and you know you have chat gpt you have claude you have bard and these are great but uh, oftentimes what you want to do is you know you want to sort of not only do you have domain data let's say internal domain data that you want to inject into these LLMs, but oftentimes you want to minimize hallucination. You want to be able to use these in production as you would any other production project, right? And I'll give a bit of background about how these sort of autoregressive language models work. GPT, for those who don't know, stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So it is a transformer that you have pre-trained in a generative fashion using causal language modeling. Uh, and essentially, GPTs are stochastic, right? They, you know, for folks who are similar to recurrent, to recurrent nets, what they do is they predict future tokens. So in this case, if I have a sentence, Milvis is the world's most popular vector blank, well, could, you know, the highest probability for that particular blank would be database. Second highest could be search, vector search engine. Uh, and then I, could, I might have the long tail might include embedding, vector embedding database or vector embedding search engine. Right. But the idea is that based on the data that has been put in that these GPTs or these uh, you know, 
causal transformers are trained with, I can get a distribution over the entire vocabulary on my output. And if I simply take the, uh, you know, I can simply take one of the higher probabilities and have that be the output result. But there's a huge downside here, right? If GPTs are stochastic, that also means that it can introduce a lot of hallucination. Now, if I have one word, if you can imagine I have one word or one phrase that is uh, sort, of, sort of one filled in token that is incorrect, then yeah, for the rest of the, for the rest of the length, and you know, for, for, for the entire, uh, for whatever other completions go beyond that, it's going to be incorrect, right? You can have these very, very plausible sounding, but factually incorrect responses. And that is a big downside for GPTs being used such as ChatGPT, GPT-4, um, you know, Claude Bard, uh, for these being used in production-ready environments, right? So, you know, a great example of uh, hallucination is the question, how do I perform query with Milvis? And if I ask ChatGPT, if you ask ChatGPT, I might give you something like this. Of course, it'll give you a different result every single time, again, because GPTs are stochastic. Uh, you have these, you, know, you get a probability distribution over all potential tokens. Uh, and, you know, if I ask ChatGPT or just basic ChatGPT or even GPT-4, I believe, you know, how do I perform a query using Milvis? I'll get this kind of response. And at first glance, it looks right. Yeah, right. And, you know, it doesn't really look like there's anything wrong with it. First, I you know, connect to a particular Milvis server. Then I create a collection. You know, I, I insert some random vectors. I build an index and perform a query. It looks right, yeah? But actually, this is not correct. And the reason is because interfacing with Milvis is not done via this imaginary Milvis client inside of Python, but really it's done with a connections object, right? So you would call, uh, you would call connection, connections.connection, and you would, again, get, you would use that as the object with which you interface with Milvis, not this imaginary Milvis client. So how do we fix this problem, right? What is the solution to hallucination? And really it's quite simple. It is to inject domain knowledge into ChatGPT, into LLMs, really to try to force in whatever way you can these LLMs to read from a knowledge base that you provide rather than you know whatever it was trained on. And the key point here that I wanna emphasize is that this domain knowledge is stored in a vector database. And a vector database really is the only way to store this domain knowledge. You can think about it, right? So if I go back way, you know, many, many slides ago to this particular slide right here, you'll see that you'll understand that, hey, natural language can be represented as embeddings. Uh, in particular, they can be represented semantically as embeddings as well. Now, this is to words, but it extends to sentences, paragraphs, even entire documents as well. You can do that representation there. Now, if I go back to this slide right here, as a domain knowledge is stored in a vector database, that's great. How does this solve my problem? I'll sort of get to that in a little bit. I'll get to the architecture of a demo app that we've built. Uh, but really, you know, if I, through this demo app, you know, this is an example, you know, if I prompt ChatGPT or GPT 3.5 with documentation from Milvis, you'll see in this case that actually gets the correct answer. I do connections.connect instead of having this imaginary, you know, Milvis Python client, right? And then the rest of it is very, very similar. I simply create a collection, I have a query vector, and I will query that vector and print the results in a sequential fashion. So we call this particular framework the CVP framework. And the idea is that we can view these large language model applications as a fully, as you know, as a general purpose computer. Now, computers have processors, they have storage, and they have code, right? And this is how we break it down. C, in this case, is ChatGPT or any other autoregressive language model. Um, this can be interpreted as the processor block in, a C, in the CVP framework. You have V, which is a vector database. Again, this can be any vector database, such as Milvis. You can interpret this as the storage block. Uh, and then you have P, prompt as code. And prompt as code is now instead of using regular, you know, instead of using, let's say, Python code, C code, um, C++ code, or even assembly code as, uh, as the 
machine language now you can instead use prompt right and this is what gives you that interface that human interface between your processor and storage blocks so how do we implement the cvp framework in practice right and i want to sort of harken back to a slide long ago using vectors to represent data and the idea here is that we can take our knowledge base and represent them as vectors why do we represent them as vectors instead of using traditional search? It's because these vectors are semantically representative of your input data. So that allows me to match, let's say, a very short query, uh, the semantic meaning of that query with the most relevant documents. That's very, very important, right? That's really what a vector database can help you do. And that's really a, a, a huge value proposition for vector databases themselves, such as Mobis, such as Zillas. And an example application that we built using, you know, using this framework that we just described, the CVP framework is called OSS Chat. Now, if I actually go back to this slide right here, this was actually generated with OSS Chat. And OSS Chat is a, it's, it's a project that we used that allows you to chat with open source projects. And essentially it implements a CVP framework, right? So it will actually take documentation online, right? Documentation about open source projects from GitHub, from the website. It will parse and store those documents as chunks into Zillow's cloud, as embeddings. And when the user asks a question, right? The question actually is then sent first to Zillis, which retrieves the most relevant documents and then sends those documents to ChatGPT as prompt. Those the most relevant documents are given to ChatGPT as prompt, same with the question, and then ChatGPT is going to be able to give you much more precise answers. Again, going back to this slide, it gives you the right answer in this case using connections.connect rather than this imaginary Milvis client that was written in Python, right? Rather than hallucinating this Milvis client. So that's OS's chat. Uh, there is a you know, we have a blog post about this as well. Uh, and for folks who want to go and play with OSS Chat you know, yourself, it is available online at osschat.io. Again, that's just one word, osschat.io. Feel free to go online. If you have your own, um, if you have your own projects or open source projects that you'd like to see on OSS Chat, we'd we'd be happy to we'd be happy to to to, to sort of take your suggestions there. Uh, we're constantly adding new open source projects every week um, and there's you know we will continue to maintain this and, uh, and sort of have that readily readily available for folks who are interested as well so this is an implementation of the cvp framework that sort of that we've created at zillas and an example of how you can use a vector database such as milvis to be able to really build out these large language model applications right all right, sort of coming up on the tail end of the slides, I only have a couple more left, but I wanted to go over t key takeaways, right? Key takeaways from the Movis community. We've seen a great, you know, really a huge amount of people who are coming to Milvis today who are interested in using Milvis with LLMs. Uh, and the first is that ML models plus vector databases are key for unstructured data management. You know, if I go back to the previous slide, you know, we have all this unstructured data out there. How do we, you know, documents, images, videos, how do we manage all of that? The, the, the answer is we run them, you know, we have these powerful machine learning models and now that are trained in some way to be able to take your input data, your input domain. And we use these embeddings, we store those embeddings inside of a vector database, right? They're key for unstructured data management. Milvis is with you every single step of the way, right? And whether you're a small time developer, you know, you're a solo developer, maybe you and one or two other folks building out an application, we have versions of Mobis for you. And then if you, you know, as you scale, as you do decide to go into production, as you do need to scale horizontally or vertically, whichever you choose to do, Milvis can do all of that for you. You can simply upgrade, you can migrate from a an embedded or a standalone instance into a cluster instance very, very easily. And really vector databases are a key component of the LLM stack, right? So if you look at LLMs, if you, you know, if you look at ChatGPT, GPT-4, Claude Bard, and a variety of the other, you know, any of the open source large language models as well, um, you know, stability LM, all of these really, if you want to be able to minimize hallucinations, 
and you want to be able to inject domain knowledge into those LLMs, you have to use vector databases, right? And, you know, these are really, you know, if we had only three key takeaways from this presentation, it would be these three. Um, and really, I hope uh, I have this presentation. I know it's coming to a bit of an abrupt end, but, you know, thank you for listening. I hope this presentation was really useful for you. And if you do want to try Zillow's Cloud, which, again, is a managed version of uh, uses Milvis as the underlying vector database, and it builds a, ton, a lot of enterprise features on top of that, feel free to try Zillow's Cloud out for free at zillows.com slash cloud. A uh, total of $400 in credits that are available to you uh, once you do sign up. Uh, and those are our socials down there as well. You know, feel free to get in touch with us at Zillow's Universe or our LinkedIn. And if you need any Milvis specific help, there's our Slack there as well. We're happy, you know, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to, to Milvis, feel free to join our Slack and go from there, right? And we also have a GitHub as well. We have a variety of sort of Milvis connectors um, and different ways that you can visualize your data inside of Milvis there too. So again, thank you. Uh, that was a sort of a introduction uh, as introduction as well, not really introduction, more of an introduction plus a deep dive into vector databases, Milvis in particular. I hope that was useful for you. Uh, thank you for listening and I uh, uh, hope to see you sometime soon.